Hi, my name is Dominique Tandon. I just finished my freshman year at UCSD. Um, I'm studying bioengineering, and this summer, because of the Cal IT2 Summer Scholars Program, I was able to work with Dr. Adam Engler and Andrew Hawley um, in the bioengineering department. The project that we worked on was called Stem Cells in Regenerative Medicine, the role of RPTP-alpha in the stiffness-based differentiation of HMSCs, human mesenchymal stem cells. So the first question is, what are HMSCs? HMSCs are human mesenchymal stem cells. They're adult stem cells that are derived from the bone marrow, and they have the ability to pro proliferate into a variety of different lineages. They can become bone cells, muscle cells, brain cells. And that's why they're so important to the field of regenerative medicine, because if we can formulate these, if we can control their differentiation, um, we can replicate and create, regenerate um, different tissues that can be used to replace damaged tissues in people's um, bodies. So um, in our lab, the main thing that we study is the extracellular matrix, how the extracellular matrix affects differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells. And um, the study that my um, experiment uh, was all based on was one done by my PI, Adam Engler. And that was centered on the idea that stiffness is what helps the differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells. Essentially, they're sensitive to the stiffness of their environment. The background behind this is that the extracellular matrix, which is composed of many polymer-like proteins, affects the stiffness of the different tissues of the body. Something like the brain has a very low stiffness of about one kilopascal, while the muscle has an intermediate stiffness about 11 kilopascals, and the bone has a very high stiffness of 34 kilopascals. Keep in mind that stiffness means, um, it's kind of, or it's referring to how well a material deforms in response to a stress. So high stiffness means it doesn't deform very much, whereas low stiffness means it deforms a lot. So what Adam Engler found was that if you play HMSCs on gels of differing stiffnesses that are mimicking these stiffnesses of the tissue, the mesenchymal stem cells tend to differentiate into that line. On one kilopascals, which mimics the stiffness of the brain tissue, the mesenchymal stem cells tend to be neurogenic. On 11 kilopascals, they tend to be myogenic, and on 34 kilopascals, they tend to be neurogenic, uh, sorry, osteogenic. So um, that's basically what my project is uh, based on. That's the background. So my question is exactly what, what are the cells doing um, to mechanotransduce these mechanical cues into biochemical pathways? Um, and what I'm actually examining is RPTP-alpha, which is the receptor-like protein tyrosine phosphatase alpha. And it's been implicated in um, cell spreading as well as formation of focal adhesions. These two behaviors are things that cells must do in order to interact with their environment. Focal adhesions are the connections that a cell makes between its internal cytoskeleton and the external matrix. And cell spreading is a behavior that the cell does when it feels its environment and likes it and wants to spread out on it. So because RPTP-alpha has been found to be integral in both of these behaviors, um, my hypothesis is that it might have a role in the differentiation of cells because it might be very integral to the mechanotransduction of external cues. So my plan in this particular project, if, if you look at my project aims, is to use siRNA that's targeted um, towards RPTP-alpha and creates RNA-induced silencing complexes that uh, prevent the translation of the mRNA for this protein to knock down the RPTP-alpha concentrations in the cell. Once I'm able to optimize that uh, knockdown, I plan to knock them down while they're on the different stiffness gels and see how that affects the differentiation of the cells. Finally, I want to probe the synergistic role of RPTP-alpha by coupling the vinculin knockdown with RPTP-alpha knockdown. And vinculin is another focal adhesion protein. So if there's a difference in how they differentiate with respect to whether they're only getting knocked down for RPTP-alpha or knocked down for both proteins, that'll kind of elucidate exactly what RPTP-alpha's role is mechanism-wise. So um, some of the basic methods that I used in my project were that I fabricated polyacrylamide gels, and I did that by um, creating a sandwich of sorts. That's a good term to describe it. Essentially, I used chlorosilinated slides, and on those slides, I mixed um, different concentrations of acrylamide and bisacrylamide to create the different stiffness gels. Um, I cultured my cells in about low, in low glucose um, serum for, I think it's 20%, um, and when I treated them, they were about 70% confluent. Um, I used RNA interference, as I explained, that was tailored towards the protein of interest. Um, I used immunoblotting and immunofluorescence, which can be abbreviated by WB and IF, and those were to kind of gauge what the concentrations of the proteins were in the cell, um, in particular RPTP-alpha. So um, the very first step of this experiment was to transfect the positive control. This is to check if my um, siRNA process or protocol is working properly. As you can see in this particular box, which was treated with 1.5 microliters of lipofectamine and 10 nanomolars of um, RNAi, 
you can see that there's a high contrast between the fluorescent marker and the background, and that shows that there was a successful transfection into the cells. Now that I've confirmed that my protocol is working, um, I went on to actually knock down the RPTP-alpha in different cells um, with three different conditions of siRNA and two conditions of lipofectamine. If you can look here, GAP-DH bands at uh, 37 kilodaltons are seen, which is the um, atomic weight of GAP-DH, but I'm unable to see any RPTP-alpha, which is an issue because that means that either RPTP-alpha is in such a low concentration in the cell that I can't see it because the antibody can't sense it, or there could be a, lack, a problem with the dilution of the antibody. So I first decided to manipulate the antibody. And um, I, I put 10 microliters of antibody and 20 microliters of antibody in a solution of 10 mils. And still, I was unable to see the RPTP alpha at 130 kilodaltons where I should have seen it. So then I decided it could be that there's not enough RPTP alpha in the cell to sense it. So I concentrated the samples 64 times. Um, and then I saw, even with varying amounts of antibody, finally I was able to see this band of RPTP alpha. Um, and what's really interesting to see is that this is the band at the 64x concentration cell, but right just to the right of it is where the band of the, um, the 1x concentrated cell would have been. So you can see that concentration has been able to let me see the RPTP alpha. So now that I was finally able to see it, um, I decided to move forward with knocking it down and then gauging how that knockdown is going to affect the differentiation. But when it came to the knockdown, even though I did see that certain samples did have less RPTP alpha confirming some knockdown, I was unsatisfied with the pattern of knockdown. And that was mainly because of this, uh, this picture right here. If you look, mainly most of the gap DH bands are very, very close in thickness, which means that it seems like there's almost the same amount of RPTP alpha present in each of the different samples, even though up here there was much, much, there was a very, very stark difference between the different bands. So what this likely means is that GAP-DH has some sort of um, threshold. It's unable to sense when there's so much protein exactly what that amount of protein is. So what that means is I need to move forward with a BSA assay, which will allow me to calculate exactly what the protein concentration is. So this was use of immunoblotting or Western blotting. I also did try immunofluorescence just to see if that would give me better results. I started off by first optimizing um, for RPTP alpha. And if you look over here in the refrigerator overnight, the incubation period um, in the refrigerator overnight gave me the best stain on the cell. So you can see very clearly the contrast between the cell and the background as opposed to the incubator for 30 minutes. What that likely indicates is that there's a very weak bond between the antibody and the antigen. Um, in this case, RPTP alpha with its antibody. So that will, so having it at a low temperature for a longer amount of time will be conducive to creating more connection between the two. Once I figured out this optimum condition, um, I knocked it down again with the same three conditions, um, 10 nanomoles, 25 nanomoles, and uh, 50 nanomoles of R siRNA, and 1.5 and 1 uh, microliters of lipofectamine. And here, I, I got you know, a very, very, uh, very unexpected um, outcome. Essentially, there's places where the treated sample had more signal or more fluorescence than the untreated sample, which indicates that um, the results are inconclusive and um, not very useful um, with immunofluorescence. Um, if, you want to take a, if you just want to take a look at this picture right here, this is a very good indicator of what RPTP alpha looks like in the cell. Um, the blue right here is the nuclear stain. Um, the red is the actin cytoskeleton, which is um, what the cell tries to connect using focal adhesions to the extracellular matrix. And the green is kind of a distribution of the RPTP alpha. So just to, just to give you guys a look at that. So overall, um, this whole experiment has been a lot of trial and error. I figured out the RPTP alpha is present in the cell, um, given the images of the IF as well as um, the Western blotting bands. I figured out that IF is not the best way, immunofluorescence is not the best way to gauge its um, its concentration because there's there's a discrepancy between what's untreated and treated and treated samples should have much less RPTP alpha. Um, but I also have figured out that the Western blot is a very strong method of kind of figuring out exactly what the concentration of RPTP alpha is because I'm able to find um, the protein um, but the caveat is that I need a very high concentration of the cell sample as well as a very high dilution of, um, of the actual antibody. Um, so the future directions. Um, what's really important for me to do now is complete the optimization um, of RPTP alpha and then use a BSA assay instead of this GAP-DH loading protein as a control to get better results. Then once I get that optimum condition, I plan to use that optimum knockdown condition and put that uh, and treat the mesenchymal stem cells on all three different stiffness cells 
with that condition and see how that affects the differentiation. And then I, I hope to couple that with vinculin knockdown and see how that further makes a difference in uh, differentiation. Hopefully all of this research will go towards elucidating RPTP-alpha's role in the stiffness-based differentiation of mes mesenchymal stem cells, which can lead to a better understanding of how we can control their differentiation and which can lead to many strides in regenerative medicine. So I'd just like to close by um, thanking the Cal-IT2 Summer Scholars Program for this great opportunity. Thanks to this uh, program, I was able to work almost like a graduate student in the lab for over 40 hours a week, you know, really dedicate myself to my work, find, find my passion for research, as well as mingle and interact with a lot of fellow scholars who are very motivated and intelligent, um, and really I profited a lot from this experience, and I'd really like to thank them for that. Thank you.